Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I jump in in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, where we believe that everyone is creative, but smart creative people don't go it alone. I'm Lauren Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're an OG listener, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, know that all are welcome here. Whether you have put your creativity on pause during this time, or whether you've clung to it like a lifeline, either way, welcome. But you may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are such good questions, and we have got answers. A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all your inspirations and fascinations. And here's the deal. We are makers who make all kinds of things. If you're like us and you're making stuff all the time or want to be making stuff all the time, you know the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry especially now. But don't despair. We are here for you and we are on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity. Things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this very podcast. Or a conscious, intentional inquiry and investigation into our own limiting beliefs. Ooh. Mm -hmm. We're going there. Ooh, I love it. Or a class that puts much of your wisdom in one easily accessible place. Mm, Every episode, we're going to reach into the spark file and exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us too. And if you're not careful, you might be moved to not just consume, but to create. So without further ado, let's open up the The spark spark file. file. Baby cams. Blackwell. Hi! Hi! How are you you doing on this fine day? I'm pretty well. Now, we are recording this before it actually happens, but by the time Mm -hmm. this airs, we will have officially launched the Spark File Select Group Creativity Coaching Program with an intrepid group, an intrepid group, that's right, (laughs) an intrepid group of creatives who are making some stuff. Yeah, I'm so, so, so excited. I'm really I'm excited, excited too. We couldn't fit everybody into this round, but no. that's it's not the last time. That's God right. willing, as long as I'm not hit by a bus and you don't get typhus, it's not the last time we'll be doing it. So that's right. So there's that. But uh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Me too. Me too. I don't know why I'm like singing things in a weird way today. I'm like, Laura, just say a sentence. <laughs> Just, just Why? say one you sentence. Sing. <laughs> um, are you well, Cams? You doing good? I'm well. Um, I'll tell you a little secret. Right before I came in here to do this recording, I said to like Wes will start to when he's tired, he'll start to make just little sounds that I'm like, oh, sounds like sleep is upon us, you know. <sighs> and so I was like, hey, is it me? Or are you making the sounds of like? 
a nap. And he's like, ah, uh, yeah, I think so. And I was like, it is a really beautiful day for a nap. It's a gorgeous day for a nap. And Wes, in, in his just infinite wisdom, said, in Florida, it seems like every day is a perfect day for a nap. Mm. It's just a gorgeous day for a nap, which I'd never considered. I have I have particular days that draw me to naps and other days that I'm like, oh, it didn't occur to me to take a nap. Is but, it weather related? Yes, it's absolutely weather related. A tiny, cool breeze, like Mm. Sort of a football Sunday kind of nap. Mm. Um, rain, of course, mm. if it's rainy. Mm. Um, yeah, all all of those things. But um, <laughs> Wes, not so much. Every day is a great day Every for day a nap. Every day is a great day for a nap, said a t-shirt that I bought at a gift shop in Florida. <laughs> what are the sounds he makes when he's gearing up to get it'll nappy? Just be like, it'll just be like some... Uh, Mm. Mm, that's the sound of sleep pressure building, mm -hmm, right? I love it. Like little sighs and little, and I'm like, oh, it's time. You're going down. I love You're that. You're going I'm, horizontal. I don't, I don't think I do that. And I don't think I know. I don't think Nathan does that. I love that. That's so I fun. It's like totally a baby love or it. something. It is. It's, it's, it's like a baby. These little, these little <laughs> signals. I really, really love it. It's quite quite adorable and I, I think I mentioned in a in a previous episode sometime like he he really has such a healthy relationship to sleep I am amazed by it and try to learn from it uh, because there's just no judgment about it it's like it's either it's time to sleep or it's time to get up no big what there are so many people that are so envious of that I I'm pr I'm a pretty good sleeper too so uh, I feel so for what a gift mm -hmm. what a gift that is to be able to I know so many of friends, Ashley Van Buren, God bless you, Ashley, if you're listening to this, Will has a, a terrible insomnia. Um, and I'm just like, I love sleep so much. And I know how much I need it and how much it blesses my life. And yeah. I, oh, I feel so I, unfortunate. I totally, I love it too. And I think one person who changed my relationship to it was a screenwriting teacher named Elatir, who I adore, but she was, you know, she was like, creatively, this is important to your creativity. If yeah. you wake up in the middle of the night and you cannot yeah. go back to sleep, just get up, get up and do some writing. Just get up. Like, don't uh, torture yourself laying in bed thinking about how you should be sleeping. She's like, get up, do some writing, then go back to bed when you're tired. And uh, and the and, and like I combine that with the the Linda Berry <laughs> teachings that you've shared with me that are yeah. like, if if you're trying to write and your body is like, I must nap, then nap. No, she says no good writing ever happened when somebody was fighting sleep. Yeah. And she also, she was really specific about be on time for class. You must be on time for class. The only excuse for not being on time for class, an emergency, of course, and the other is if you were sleeping. Amazing. <laughs> Which I thought I was, mean, I thought was what amazing. a gift. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, something you never hear from instructors. But She's that is such a gift. Special. Yeah. Instead of napping, and I hope we hey, haven't put hey. you to sleep, little listeners. Um, <laughs> shall we share us? some sparks? Are you ready to spark yeah. out? Yes, I'm. I'm excited to share this because I think this falls into the category of like really useful information. Uh, I think. Your teaser at the top sounds, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm here for this. Hold on. Let me get something to write with and something to write on because I know I'm going to have to take some notes. Okay. And speaking of sounds, will you promise me you'll edit out the weird sounds I'm making? I don't know nope. why. I'm they like, all stay ah. in. okay, here we go. <laughs> so, oh. I'm so, gonna, in fact, I'm going to put extra weird sounds in. <laughs> make it seem like I made those sounds. Please do I'm gonna that. I'm going to take yeah. sound, weird sounds you've made in other episodes <laughs> and just layer them. Thanks. Great. Great. Yep. Great. Okay. So listen, I recently, I've been sparked by an idea and this is like, this is one of those things that I learned about many years ago, but recently have gotten this information again, repackaged in a new way that really helped me to see it in a new light. Like it all became really clear for me. 
And I think this information might be useful to others. So I'm super excited to share it. So years ago, I learned about the concept of deserve levels. Yeah, And we've talked about Which this, I right? learned from you. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And deserve levels are really about what you believe you're worthy of having in life. Maybe it's a certain amount of money or a certain level of career set success or whether or not you deserve a job you love or relationship you love or how much Mm. health and fitness, just how much enjoyment and fulfillment you deserve to have in life. And with deserve levels, the idea is that they are often subconscious, like you may be unaware of them, but you likely have a floor, like a level you refuse to drop below Mm -hmm. and a ceiling, a level that if you start to exceed it, you begin to feel uncomfortable, you know, uh, whoa, I'm, I'm exceeding where I, where I deserve to be. This ceiling, this upper limit is the spark I want to talk about today. So I've been reading a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Ooh! Yowza! The whole book is about how we can each get into our own zone of genius where our life is in flow, we're doing work that we love, we're abundant in purpose, in relationships, in wealth, and in health. Camps. And, yeah, babe. Everyone is, so, everyone is talking about this book. We take a class. Everybody yes. in class is talking about this book. I haven't read this book. So it sounds like you're into it. You're way up into this book. Is mm-hmm. it? Does it live up to the hype? Yes. Yes, it does. Now, I should say this. Everyone in our class is reading it, but it's not a brand new book. Um, I think it's maybe four, three, four years ago. I guess she holds up. Um, And the thing is, like I said, like it isn't, it isn't entirely novel. Like um, it isn't, it isn't like you're like, I've never heard of anything like this before. It's, it, it's just that the way he combines the information, explains it, names Mm. it, Mm -hmm. it all kind of clicks together like a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And in ways that I'm like, "Ah, technically, I kind of know all of this, except now, Gay Hendrix has helped me to like, actually metabolize it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think it's worth it. Mm, Okay. So um and there's there's a bunch of stuff in the book that I'm not going to focus on today, but I am going to focus on. That's what we do on this podcast. We scratch the surface. Uh, we baby. scratch the surface. As Hendrick says, life is at its best when love, money, and creativity are growing in harmony. Say it again for the people in the in back. the back. Life I is it. at its best when love, money, and creativity are growing in. harmony harmony. Absolutely. But we can only have all of that if we address what Hendrix calls the one problem that holds us back. And that problem is the upper limit problem. (laughs) Essentially, the upper limit blocks us from allowing any additional goodness, joy, prosperity into our life because we have reached the limit where we feel comfortable, where we, you know, we've reached the limit of what we feel is allowable or deserve levels, what we deserve. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to gain success in any of these areas, we will literally self sabotage to make sure that we do not exceed that limit. Hmm. Sure. Maybe like we'll get a windfall of money, maybe a promotion or a tax return and almost immediately we've created a situation where that money must be spent on a medical bill, a traffic ticket, a home repair, whatnot. And we get ourselves back down to the same amount of money we had in our bank account. Yeah. Whew. Crisis averted. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it could be we get a particular opportunity or achievement we've been hoping for. And after like a moment of joy that we allow ourselves, our minds wind up with worry about something else. Maybe we pick a fight with our spouse or our best friend, and now we're back down to our emotional comfort zone. Great. Keeping ourselves just below our upper limit. Um, It could be more extreme than that, but 
our behavior will keep us from achieving anything close to our upper limit. I think of this when people say, well, it's, if it's not one thing, it's another. <laughs> With an upper limit problem, like just when something good happens to you, something else falls apart. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's a coincidence. Mm-hmm. Most likely, you are contributing to that yourself because you don't believe you can have everything. You don't believe you're allowed to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. Is all this making sense? One million percent. And then I I just want to say this. I don't, I think what you're not saying is that when something like if you get a cancer diagnosis, it's not your fault. That's not what is being said. One hundred percent. I absolutely, and I'm very, very, very careful about this. My mom battled cancer her whole life, and yeah. I'm, I'm adamant about that. Like I, I get it, and he does venture into the territory of like, and then you get a cold, and you can't give the pre, or you get laryngitis, and you can't give the presentation that you needed to give. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I'm a little more open to the idea of those those small things. But now, if no. if you like, if it was a thing, it, this it's an interesting thing. Part of me is like, it's good to consider what things you are at cause for, as they would say in certain programs, what you are at cause yeah. for, instead of it, you're, it's your fault. But it, the, a better line of thinking to me is if you have an important presentation that you're going to give that could be the key to advancing your career and the night before you stay out talking and screaming and talking at a bar and you sort of self-sabotage yourself, that to me is like, uh, that to me, I'm like, the, you've got an upper limit problem. You've got an upper limit problem. Absolutely. Yeah. It can be as simple as... um it can be simple as simple as like getting a promotion and then the next time you're on your phone on the phone with like your spouse your loved one like just picking a squabble picking a fight and like mm. why did i mm-hmm. now now my home life feels disrupted and and huh. now i'm focused on that instead of like allowing this good thing to enter my yeah. life yeah but yeah. yes i'm with you and i love that i love that you're doing this because i'm always interested for myself for you and I, for our, you know, coaching clients, people like that. I'm interested in pushing that, push that limit. Limit. Love it. Push yeah. that upper limit. Love it. Love 100%. it. hundred percent. Um, one really pronounced example of the upper limit problem is the lottery phenomenon. Like Ooh. why do the majority of lottery winners end up divorced, deceased, broke again in five years? Broke. So broken, broken. Some of it can be attributed to an upper limit problem. All of a sudden you've got your finances covered, but your family falls apart or your friendships mm. fall apart, etc. cetera. Mm. But many, 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 many people experience this phenomenon on a daily basis. And it can happen at any level, whether you're, a multi-millionaire, but you don't believe uh, you can be wealthy and have a happy relationship, mm. um, or there's a limit to how much money you feel like you're allowed to make. Um, but we talk to many clients and potential clients about their goals and desires. And when we ask, what do you think has held you back from achieving said goals? So many people say me. I so have. many people. Oh my gosh. I yes. have. They, they know. Sure do. They're like, I have gotten in my own way. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna get personal here for just a second on a on on this personal note. I I think I've talked about my upbringing a bit on the show, but just to dig a little deeper. I have a very specific experience of being raised by a mother who was a narcissist. I've written about this and talked about it pretty openly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to say, make no mistake, I love my mother very much. And I know she did the very best that she could. Of course, as I've gotten older and learned more and more, I suspect that she was dealing with some demons in her own life. And I'm not sure she was ever able to shake them, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. There's many things that a child of a narcissist doesn't understand. One of them is that 
there are times that you can tell that you're not pleasing your parent. You seem to be like the cause of pain for them, but you're a kid and you have no idea how and why you're causing them pain. But in retrospect, and after years of therapy, I could see that my mother was struggling with two truths. One, she loved me and wanted me to be happy. But two, she resented the fact that I had opportunities for happiness that she had never had. Mm. So as a result, every accomplishment that I achieved seemed to cause her pain. And I felt that. I didn't understand it, but I felt it. Um. Uh, like I remember times like I gave a speech in front of the whole school community in sixth grade and I watched my mom torment herself that if a 12 year old could do it, why couldn't she? Wow. When my first play was published, my mom said, but I'm the writer in the family. When I began traveling for work and going places that she had always dreamt of going, I would consciously like bring her gifts from everywhere I went, but it eventually like it got too painful to even talk about where I was traveling. Wow. It was tough and it went on. I can't lie. Like some of those things nearly shut me down. Yeah. In fact, I'm sure there were long gaps of time where I did shut down my creative writing. I don't blame my mom for this anymore. I think she was in pain because yeah. again, she didn't have the opportunities to do many of the things I did. And of course I acknowledge she's the reason why I did have those opportunities. So I really think she was battling with that inside, but she, but she did, you know, support me and, and make sure like that I did go to college, that I did open up these opportunities for myself. So, so that was tricky, but mm -hmm. I have since learned that this type of dynamic among family members can have the effect of training a person that there's only so far they can go, yeah. only so far they can achieve without bringing negative responses into their life. Yeah. Like in my case, if I succeeded, I felt like I would inflict pain on someone that I loved. Wow. And I... I wanted to do both. I mean, I wanted to like make my mom happy and be able to do these things, but it, mm -hmm. it creates a contradiction. So this childhood dynamic is just one way that you can form an upper limit problem. Mm. It can also come in other forms. It might be that you were taught um, not to like outshine a sibling, or mm -hmm. it might be that you saw your family made a lot of money, but your parents weren't happy together. You might have learned from that experience that, sure, you can be wealthy, but you can't have true love. It's one or the other. Yeah. So no matter how your upper limit problem formed, if you have this belief system, if you have an upper limit problem, you will sabotage yourself whenever you hit this perceived limit of success. If you often think the only thing that's getting in my way is me, it might be time to examine whether or not you have an upper limit problem. So by definition, it is the upper limit problem is the place or circumstance causing us to begin to sabotage further progress because we've hit a perceived limit of success or victory in our life. Okay. I.e. we're now out of our comfort zone and we will work to get back inside that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. In the book, Hendrix has compiled, like from years of research and conversations, he's an executive coach. So he coaches a lot of people operating at a very high level who discover they have an upper limit problem. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's compiled them all and realized they that all of these upper limit problems really stem from four hidden barriers. The first one is feeling fundamentally flawed. This is the biggest and the most widely shared hidden barrier. This is the very common fear that too many people believe that there's something fundamentally wrong with us and therefore we do not deserve great success and happiness. Hendricks writes, if you have a deep old feeling that there's something wrong, bad, or flawed about you, you will find yourself grappling with that issue every time you break through to greater love and financial abundance. When you surpass your upper limit thermostat setting, a little voice admonishes you from deep within your mind, 
You should not be this happy or this rich or this creative because you are fundamentally flawed. This thought creates cognitive dissonance, the mind rattle that occurs when you try to hold two opposing thoughts at the same time. Given that I am fundamentally flawed or wrong or bad, how can I possibly be this happy, rich, or creative? Mm -hmm. The cognitive dissonance must be resolved in one of two ways. One, by returning to your previous thermostat setting, Mm -hmm. or two, by letting go of the old limiting belief, which Mm -hmm. allows you to stabilize at a new, higher level. Yes. Yes, yes, yes to that. So the next hidden barrier is disloyalty and abandonment. This one is interesting. This one is the fear that having a certain level of success means that you would be being disloyal or leaving behind people who have been there for you in the past. Ah. We pull back from greater success because we fear we will end up all alone, abandon Ah. our roots, and leave behind people who we care for. Mm-hmm. I feel this one a lot because I moved to New York City from the Midwest. I've actually had family members express the fact that they felt I abandoned them. Mm. Um, I've had others give me a, oh, look at you. Uh, mm-hmm. So fancy now. And all of this was sort of an air of like, who does she think she is? Vibe. Yeah. And it hurts. It hurts. I've certainly had those worries of like, am I going to end up alone and destitute? Um, thankfully I've communicated with the people that I love and let them know, like I'm here for them just because I chose to live somewhere else. Doesn't mean that I've abandoned them. Um, and I try to live my life in a way that encourages others to pursue their, their own happy place as well. But it's a very, very real idea that it might be, if I graduate college, that was true for me too. Um, Uh, I, you know, that will separate me from certain uh, people and and places. If I move to another town, if I make a certain amount of money, if I achieve something or or if I have a new set of friends, fancy friends that we like, will that mean abandoning and being disloyal to the people who've been there for me in the past? And that is a barrier that many, many people feel when they come up, up against it. The next hidden barrier is believing that more success brings a bigger burden. If you Hmm. believe that you are a burden to others, or you think that you being fully you would be a burden to others, then you might also believe that greater success would mean greater problems. The mantra of this hidden barrier is, I can't expand to my highest potential because I'd be an even bigger burden than I am now. This might be the case for like um, children who were born into tough circumstances, like to a single parent or a family with financial limitations. Um, You might have grown up feeling like your very presence in the family was a burden. I'm actually thinking about um, Sir Ken Robinson, who we talked about a few weeks ago. And thank goodness he didn't have this problem. He could have. He was born into a family of seven children. His dad had been in an accident that left him quadriplegic. At age four, Sir Ken was diagnosed with polio. I mean, his mother must have had a very challenging time, and yet she did not cause her children to feel like burdens. So kudos to her. But that's an example of the kind of circumstances where someone might believe that they're a burden and therefore unable to achieve greater accomplishments. Yes, when you Seuss. said it, I actually flashed on something else. Believing that more success brings bigger burden reminds me of Biggie Small saying, "Mo money, mo problems." Uh huh. Uh huh. And this is something that I actually have. Uh, Curse of the Lottery, those yes. shows that also, it's yeah. sort of like, oh, if you start earning too much money, if you start, then it really, it creates a bunch of problems. Like it's yeah. going to be like, what if, what if relatives start coming to you and, and asking for help and handouts? What if uh, you, you know, the higher you have higher visibility. And so that draws more criticism and more, yeah. 
So that's where my mind goes yeah. when you say that, believing that more success brings a bigger burden. I think yes to all of that. And that relates very much to money. I also think about women who are s- supporting a family and raising kids, but also have a dream of their own. And mm. so them taking a class at night or taking their Saturdays to work on something else could be a burden to the family. It could feel like, oh, we have to get, we have to get a babysitter. We don't have have to fold the laundry. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. It could be, yeah, it can be a lot of that. And it can be like, oh, me pursuing my thing is going to cause problems for other people. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And the final, the fourth hidden barrier is the crime of outshining. This one is really common among gifted and talented children. This fear often emerges from a strong subliminal message they receive from their families that if you shine too much, you'll make other people feel bad or look bad. So greater levels of success and happiness often trigger these fears, which then, of course, cause us to pull back to lower levels. Yeah. So this felt so... Midwestern to me. I'm not sure if you feel it, but oh God, the modesty sometimes, the false modesty sometimes that is encouraged, like literally confidence can be called conceitedness. And there is a real fear of being considered conceited. So if you're shining too brightly, you best tone it down real quick. Yeah. Uh, Getting too big for your britches that idea of who do you think you are and and it's not fair it's not fair to your brother it's not fair to your sister it's not fair um you know because when you ex- excel at that level you're making your brother feel bad so amazing it's this, this it's interesting a, i'm i'm sitting here and i know that i'm i'm a little quiet but it's this is amazing and i'm just like working through this in I know real you're time. taking notes. It's so good. It's so good. I uh, don't worry. I feel that. I know you're contemplating it. Um lucky for us, Hendrix doesn't just explain how and why we can upper limit ourselves. Yes, you can use it as a verb. <laughs> um he also gives us tools to work through it and to remove the block so we can continue to allow ourselves more fulfillment in life. And again, this book, I have to say read it. If any of this intrigues you, read it cuz this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm focusing on the upper limit problem, but he's really trying to get you entirely into your what he calls the zone of genius. So there's a lot more to it, but Hendrick says in an article in Forbes, in my work, we identify the underlying issues that trigger the upper limit problem so that people can rise smoothly to higher and higher levels of their potential Mm. without bumping their heads against the false ceilings that are held Mm. in place by negative belief systems. I like the sound of it. Right? So just to give you a quickie here, if you want to start looking for signs in your day-to-day life that you are upper limiting yourself, here are a few. Number one, worry. In particular, if you are worrying about something that you have no control over, it isn't useful. You're wasting time and energy on this worry. Hendrick says, I encourage you to make a careful study of your worry habits. I've seen a lot of lives change when people drop their addiction to worry. Mm. Woo. And when you call it an addiction, that just speaks <laughs> too clearly to me. That is too real. This yeah. past year, the past four years, yeah. it's been real easy to get addicted to a news cycle and to be worried about things that we can't control. Yeah, those neural pathways can get really strong strengthened and then the um, our little electrical yes. impulses just want to travel those worry pathways because they're yes they're so familiar yeah. and they're comfortable um, but he describes worry thoughts as ways to avoid feeling the flow of positive energy and that's clear mm-hmm. it's an energetic block to the good things in your life yeah. so you want to notice those times that you are worrying about things that you can't control You want to pause, take a breath, ask yourself what good things 
are trying to enter my life right now. And literally imagine as you expand your lungs, imagine expanding your possibilities, expanding your capability to hold goodness and joy Mm. and fulfillment. So to be conscious of allowing the flow of positive energy in your life is a big theme. Um, Another thing you might look for in your life is criticism and blame. And guess what? According to Hendrix, self-criticism and criticizing others are one and the same. Ah, we are all the wave. We are all the ocean. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right? Self-blame is part of the same upper limit pattern as blaming someone else. Both Mm. criticizing yourself and criticizing others are highly addictive and very popular ways of busting up the flow of positive energy. Yeah. Key here is that it's the same as worry. Criticism is useful only if it can produce a useful result. What can Mm. you learn from it and move on? Wait, I have to write that down. mm -hmm. Criticism is useful. Say it again. Only if it can produce a useful result. Criticism is useful only if it can produce a useful result. That's right. You know, I think that's such a great spark as we head into the Spark File Select Group Creativity Coaching Program, because we are going to be talking a lot about how um, re- how feedback, how, how we can ask for feedback, how we can receive feedback in a way that to borrow from you and Leslie Odom Jr. feels like a puzzle piece snapping <laughs> into place. And this, these words you just That's said, useful. criticism is, is useful only if it can produce a useful result. That's right. Like that's another great way of saying it and thinking about it. And the addiction to criticism and blame is fascinating because as it relates to feedback, you know, we've talked about this phenomenon that some people do not feel they have received feedback unless they have received like a shit ton of criticism. Yeah. Because that's what they're like, they like really are for. feeling the pain. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If you don't yeah. rip this up, then you haven't actually given me any notes. Um, and so we get addicted to that. Again, it is part of blocking the positive energy. And if we mm. can, you know, I think about the times when let's say we, we do a workshop or, um, or a performance or a spark, frankly, we do a recording and, And, you know, a a past me might have been like, if you were like, oh, Cam's, that was amazing. I love that. And I'd be like, yeah, but remember that, that one thing in that first section, I tripped up, I messed up. And then I could spin on that for hours and it would, it would completely block any praise or yes. good feelings yeah. around the whole event, even though it was a fucking split second. I call those 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 perseverations the cigarette burns on my brain oh. because I think in those moments when that happens, uh, uh, there's a flood of chemicals into our body, some cortisol and some adrenaline, and to me, it literally feels like there's a burn, like a scorch on my brain, yes. and I keep t- thinking about it. A, and t- like touching it like and just being like oh my god that hurts oh my god that thing oh my god oh my god that thing and you're right exactly. it's so so that takes up all the bandwidth and then you're talking about this like blocking the flow yep. of positive things yeah it's blocked because it's, it's taken blocked. up by that little cigarette burn on my brain can't see or feel any of the positiveness because yeah. that that's right that little burn is scathing so Um, The key here, of course, is what can you learn from it and move on? That's it. Yeah. So another way you might be ulping yourself. mm -hmm, ULP, ulping. (laughs) Did you make that up? I didn't. They talk about it in the book. I was like, okay, nerds. That's good. I like like some made up. I like some made up words. Yep. Sure. Sort of like a gulp. I'll take. Yes. Uh, Gulp. So another way that you might gulp yourself is by (laughs) deflecting. Uh, If you are offered kindness, compliments, gifts, acts of generosity, and you refuse them, you are deflecting. You are literally blocking 
the positive energy from coming in. Take the compliment. Say thank you. Say thank you. Let it in. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it's it's positive energy. If you just think about it, like what positive things are trying to enter my life right now? And I'm like Wonder Woman here, you know, block, <laughs> block, block. And um, what if we it, stop doing that? Harville Hendricks says it's like when you do that, it's like going to a banquet and then not allowing yourself to eat. Ugh. When somebody like pays you a compliment and you just cannot take it and you mm -hmm. have to deflect it, it's, it's like going to a banquet and not permitting yourself and to eat. And not letting yeah. yourself eat. That's yeah. true. Those are some of the, they're not all the ways, but those are some of like the more, um, common and I don't want to say simple, but, but kind of simple ways that we sabotage ourselves without even thinking at the end of the day, I really sabotaged myself today. Mm -hmm. But you might have, if you spent all day on your phone, reading the news and worrying about something, um, it's a way that you may be keeping yourself from moving forward and learning and growing and giving yourself permission to succeed. One of the more complex ways that we sabotage and I really think this is interesting, something that he calls an integrity breach. And in this context, he means integrity in the sense of wholeness and completeness. Mm -hmm. It's the physics definition rather than the moral definition. Mm -hmm. Morality is about good and bad. Mm -hmm. But before morality came into play, the definition of integrity had to do with wholeness and completeness, meaning to be in integrity meant that you were whole and complete. If an integrity breach had occurred, there was a gap in your completeness. This makes me think of um, Louise Hay. She's one of like the OG spiritual healers. And my mm -hmm. mom used a number of her mantras and books with um, her biofeedback sessions with some of her doctors. And one of her key mantras is, I am perfect, whole, and complete. And I used to say that. I would mirror that. Mm -hmm. I am perfect, whole, and complete. And it makes so much sense to me now in terms of this integrity, the integrity breach. Um, yeah, I loved, you, I love Louise Hay. Can you give me an example of uh, an integrity breach? I sure because can. Of, oh, good, good, good. I sure can. Um, so an integrity breach, one of the biggest would be a lie that we tell ourselves or a blockage we create between us and our own intuition. You know when you don't want to know the answer to something? such as like, uh, it's time to leave this job. Mm. It's time to leave this relationship. Mm -hmm. Something that we do not want to know. So mm -hmm. we try to keep ourselves from seeing it or feeling it. Think of it like a kink in the hose. And if there's no kink, if our integrity is intact, we're in communication with ourself, our intuition, it's in flow and we have integrity. If we put a kink in that hose to block off a certain part, to avoid a certain part, maybe it's something that we're having an issue with. Maybe it's a lie we're telling ourselves. Maybe it's something we don't want to know. Um, then we have a breach. For for these integrity breaches, Hendrix suggests asking yourself a series of questions. These aren't all of them, but they include, where do I feel out of integrity with myself? What important feelings am I not letting into my awareness? Mm. Where in my life am I not telling the full truth? Mm. Yeah. Where in my life have I not kept my promises? Mm. So he, I just think that is, I think that's really, really interesting because um, it relates to like just all of the people that we are speaking to who say, I'm, I'm the one that's holding me back. I think this is a worthy exploration to, to figure out what's going on inside of yourself. Um, 
What things are you telling yourself? You might be telling yourself, I can't leave this job because A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Or you might be telling yourself, I can't find time to write this play because A, B, and C. And the answer that you don't want to hear is, oh, you could. It's going to require some sacrifices. It's going to require some changes. Um, but you could. You could do it. Um, so it is it is really about going deep. Yeah. He also encourages us to explore our family stories that hold us back. Word. Family stories word, 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 are word, word, word. so powerful these stories and they were put in place oftentimes with very good intentions mm -hmm. to help people learn from the past here's a snippet of his explanation of family stories in one family the story might be that genius leads to irresponsibility there was old uncle george who left his wife and seven kids behind to go off seeking his genius in the world of fiji and has never been heard from again Another family, the story might be that genius leads to madness. There's old Aunt Celia who retreated to her room in 1927 to write poetry and for the next 40 years could always be heard cackling and howling up there. Another family story might be that genius leads to poverty and decrepitude. Cousin Freddie spent his life trying to perfect an engine that ran on club soda and was forced to support himself in his old age by becoming a paper boy. These stories are passed down from generation to the next generation to protect members of the clan from straying too far. Mm -hmm. My family has stories as well. It occurred to me that sometimes the moral of the story isn't shared explicitly. Like he, that the descriptions that Hendrix just gave, he also gave like what the, what the takeaway was. But mm -hmm. when you hear these stories as a child, you may take in certain meanings and internalize it, even though it was never explicitly stated. Do you know what I mean? Like your yeah. each child is kind of forming in their mind what that story means. Yeah, absolutely. In my family, there is a story about the futility of pursuing your dreams. Really? They most likely are not going to work out. So don't get too excited. Yeah. Oof. Don't get your hopes up. I think it comes from two stories in particular that I heard a lot as a child. Um, my On my dad's side, they were all runners. And Uncle Johnny, like, just missed the Olympic trials by, you know, a uh, few tenths of a second against Ooh. a person. And it was something he had given years of his life to. Um, and his younger brother, Uncle Tommy, had actually qualified for the Olympic trials, did not know he had and on the day of the trials, they were like holding the race and they were like, Tommy, where are you? They got a hold of him and he was like, what do you mean? Where am I? They're like, the race, like the race is about to start. What are you doing? And so he missed his opportunity even to run in the trials. Um, and so these stories and with in much greater detail were handed down um, and so there's a knee-jerk reaction to anything good that happens to someone that's like, that's great. And even if that's all that ever happens, that's great. Like, that's enough. Don't get yourself worked up about, like, something gr even greater than that. Do you have a family story, Suze? I do think that there's a little bit of a, like, don't get too big for your britches don't uh -huh. you know a little bit uh -huh. of that sort of thing and yeah. i'm realizing uh i've realized this before but it's sort of coming into focus as we're talking now slowly coming into focus that a lot of the way that i've dealt with that is just being like if you think that I'm too much, or this is too much, or I'm too big for my britches, I will just <laughs> absent myself and I'll do my work. I'm going to keep doing my work, but I'm going to do it uh -huh. outside of the reach of any sort of like ongoing scrutiny. And yes. I'll share, I'll, I'll yeah, send missives back. That makes back. perfect sense. But, but I'm gonna, yeah. I, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that there are other people who move yeah. to 
from small towns to big cities in order to not only be around other like-minded, in our case, creatives, but also because it's sort of like, it's hard to, (laughs) you can't say things to me uh, we, you know, when you can't see me regularly and you don't know that's right exactly what I'm doing on you a daily basis, you don't have a say in like my daily. You don't have a say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I'll say, you know, for both of our families, I I mean, I can say that my family has like a story about this. Knowing full well, the adults in my life absolutely loved me, and um, yeah. I think that it's so natural to be like. I don't want this child to experience the pain of heartache. What it like, I want them to excel, but what if they try and they don't, can't do it. And then they're going to to get hurt. They're going to get hurt. Yeah. 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 But I think that, that, you know, we talk about this frequently, the idea of um, there is a certain point that, the pain of not doing something, the pain of not trying becomes far greater than the potential pain of not succeeding at it. So that is yeah. the, you know, that's the I, hurdle I, I want to jump. I think if I was going to give a slogan to what you just described, it's better safe than sorry. Ah, interesting. Better safe than sorry. That's right. That's and, right. And I do think a lot of uh, parents and, you know, maybe teachers, caregivers are, as you were saying, acting from a place that is born out of love yeah. and wanting to protect, you know, yeah. little people from pain. Yeah. So better safe than sorry. Yeah. And maybe somewhere, someone in the family did lose all their money and end up destitute because they pursued a dream. It's possible. It's possible that yeah. that's in the family line, but curious, like that person's voice doesn't get to weigh into the story and say it was worth every minute, you know, <laughs> who knows, who knows? Yeah. So ultimately this entire book is about how to remove these barriers that we've put in place and, and allow more positive flow into your life and get you into your personal zone of genius. I'm into this. Hendrix has a penchant for what he calls practical spirituality, which is acting from your deepest chosen commitments in such a way that it simultaneously elevates your life and the lives of those you touch. It's Mm. not about adopting any kind of specific religious belief. It's about connecting with people on what he calls an essence to essence manner. When we connect with our own essence at deeper levels, we also open a deeper connection with others. So what do we make of all of this, Suze? Mm. I think we make a habit of checking ourselves, looking into those times and places where we roadblock the positives that are trying to enter our life. Yeah, I think we make conscious efforts to expand our capacity for good, our capacity for joy, and really let ourselves have it. And of course, all of this, I mean, as creatives, all of this is useful to understand human nature in the sense that any of this is up for grabs in character development and storytelling, certainly it's all relatable. I want to leave you with just a few thoughts about my mom. Her, one of her deepest wishes was that the cycle of dysfunction would be broken. She never named that exact dysfunction, but the more I've learned about narcissism, the more I think she was describing that dynamic. Mm. I know she wanted to be happy for me. I know she wanted me to be happy. She is single-handedly responsible for me going to therapy. When my parents divorced, she asked the judge to mandate that all of us kids would get counseling, three sessions. And I went to those three sessions, and I've been going to therapy on and off my (laughs) entire life. And it changed my life. She gave me that gift. She made sure that the cycle was broken. And I believe in my heart that she would be happy to know that I have broken through my upper limit and that I'm allowing for even more goodness and joy in my life. Yes. So I will leave you with a quote from another of my mom's favorites, Marianne Williamson. You may know this one. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light 
not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence liberates others. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> Shalom, There's my spark. That is a great spark. I cannot wait to read that book and all of my wah, 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 free time question what? mark. When? But it, it's just given me so much to think about and articulated so many feelings that I have and experiences that I've lived. And I think back, you know, Cami, and I've talked about this with you. I've talked about it on the podcast. I have historically bless. Bless the Lord, my soul. This is more historic than present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, struggled with real debilitating stage fright. And mm -hmm. I knew it then. I, I knew it on some level. I knew it, but I couldn't necessarily, um, the knowledge didn't manage it. I knew on some level that it was an upper limit problem because it would show up in a very visceral way when I was in situations, I think I was, I think you were, we were talking about this the other day. I remember super clearly mm -hmm. that years and years and years and years ago, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, who some of you may know from Broadway and some of you may know from Modern Family, Jesse Tyler Ferguson put together a benefit at Joe's Pub in New York City. And it was yeah. a performance of a concert of the music of Michael John Lacusa, specifically his musical Big Fish. And so Jesse pulled the cast together and he thought it'd be really fun if Heidi Blickenstaff and I sang one of the songs from the show. And all of the other people in it were Broadway performers. I had not been on Broadway yet, but everybody else had been. And I mm -hmm. was shitting myself. I was in the green room oh. at Joe's pub and everybody else was like chatting about, I remember so clearly, just like Celia Keenan-Bolger being like, I like your nail polish to, you know, another Broadway performer and this and that. <laughs> and I was sitting there just relaxed shaking. And... They were so relaxed and oh. I was shaking and my temperature, I could feel the heat rising oh. off of my body and I was just breathing and trying to manage it all. And I remember Leia Deliria looking over at me and going, you're really nervous, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. Ugh. Like I had a real yeah. visceral response. Not like I was about to go on stage and sing what was a fairly easy, straightforward song, but like I was being chased by a saber toothed tiger. And it was uh -huh. the visceral physical manifestation, I believe, of an upper limit problem. Of a for yeah. limit problem. Yeah. That yeah. And makes total sense. Yeah, it was through a lot of different things, like a lot of therapy, a lot of meditation has really helped me, but also um, prolonged exposure to situations where this is, I think of how all of these things that we talk about are so interrelated um, to some of the, the, the fundamental pieces of resilience and processing uh, the stress response cycle processing all the way through uh -huh, it, uh -huh. how it, it took some prolonged exposure to situations where I was like, oh, I can totally hang with these Broadway people. And I yeah. may not sing like them and I may not sound like them and I may not be as beautiful as them, but I have other gifts. And I uh, even I remember that night, like going out, doing that concert and killing, like really like getting huge laughs. And I was like, oh, like, so it was a uh -huh. very slow uh -huh. process. I had to come at it from a lot of different angles, but I'm telling you it was an upper, upper limit, limit problem. Yes. And the other thing that I keep thinking about from the moment you started this is, did you ever see the perks of being a wallflower or read that book? 
Do you I know did. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Film? Paul Rudd plays the, I think, English teacher in that movie. And he says something, which is a line I love from that book. People accept the love they think they deserve. Uh, we accept yes. the love we think we deserve. Yes. Yes. And I think we accept yes. the fill in the blank that we think we deserve. 100%. For years, I wanted a career that looks very much like the one I have now, but I didn't have that career and I was accepting the blank uh -huh. career that I felt I deserved. And it's true of love. It's true of, it's true of so many things. We accept the blank we think we deserve, but I think by, by dealing with things like this upper limit problem, we really can expand expand, expand our capacity to let positive things enter our lives and flow yes. through us. I yes. freaking love it, Camion. I'm going to put it, uh, this is going in the Spark File <gasps> Hall of Fame. This yeah. Spark. Oh, it's thanks. an immediate, it's an instant classic. <laughs> I'm telling you. Mm. Wow. So good. I'm happy. So good. I'm happy. Yay. Yay. Thank Can't you. wait that to hear wonderful. yours. The Spark File. That nice. was so good. Oh. That was so good. I loved you like taking notes. That was awesome. That was so good, Camion. I Thank loved it you. so much. And I Thank do you. think it's true. We accept the collaborators we think we deserve. Oh, we yeah. accept the oh my gosh. And if we get if we get some that we're like we will fuck it up if we get ones that are like higher than what we think we deserve with if we don't examine it properly we could you could risk it but you can yeah. you can always rate maybe i should have said this or could say this like say you, it now okay are we recording we've never and stopped. we're back <laughs> <laughs> we never left um the the thing is you can raise your upper limit that's the thing. That's the empowering thing is that, you know, yes, it left, left, if you did nothing about any yeah. of that, every time you came upon your upper limit and you got something that you thought you didn't deserve, you would fuck it up or you'd find a way to yeah. maybe keep that the fuck up something else. Like yeah. you would balance the scales to stay in your comfort zone, the adequate mm -hmm. amount of comfort um, mm -hmm. and just enough success and that's it. But you have within your power to increase your upper limit, increase and expand the amount, your capacity for goodness and fulfillment and joy. And Love when it. you think you've hit that limit, you have the capacity to move the limit up again, up and up and I up. I can see you were asking me what if I had any of those stories in mind for my family. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep working on that. But I can also see how if you you could create a story where if you came from, if you were a child of divorce, you could have a story that, you know, marriages don't work, that, yep. you know, things like that. And you could, as an adult, get into your own romantic relationships uh -huh. and then find a way to sabotage it even because you even more specifically you could say oh it doesn't marriages don't work if the woman makes more money than the man exactly marriages yeah. don't yeah. work if the father has to travel for work no chance it's not gonna yeah. work out like you can apply yes it can get so so specific and then you can back your ass right into that scenario that's right Oh my God. This is so good. I can't wait to, I don't know when the fuck I'm going to find the time to read that book, but I'm going to find the time <laughs> the to read thing that book. Is, one of the things is that it is, I don't want to say it's an easy read because I don't want to diminish the content, but it is easy in that he has taken these concepts that you are familiar with mm -hmm. and organized them in a way that makes it goes perfect down smooth. sense yeah. and then written it in a way that like the pages just fly by. I mean, the only thing that slowed me down in this book is like all the things I was writing in the margins. That's, that's what I was thinking. Like there's so many, I have a stack of books, some, some beautiful books you've given me, some books that I've sought out. And, uh, and I, I think it is one thing to read or take in any of this information it's another thing to, to it's one thing to watch the ted talk it's one thing yeah. to like read the book it's another thing to actually 
ingest it, metabolize it, get it into your bones and get it into your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I'm, I think this seems, this is, this is, this is rising on the charts with the bullet. I, I feel like it's going to be super useful. I think it is too. I hope you do. And I also would love to request a redo of a moment from earlier today where I feel like I had an upper limit problem and I did not take something in and allow myself to have it. So what was it? You have been so wonderful in praising me and my off the office that I'm putting together. And I have noticed that every time if you mention it and you're like, oh, it looks amazing. Do you love it? I'm like, I do. I, I like sort of take it down. Like, I'm just wondering, am I... I, am I not feeling like it's okay for me to have an office that I fucking love? I mean, I spent all that time in the dining room, but now this is why I want to redo that moment. I want to say thank you. Yes, I love this office. It's really coming together. It's it's bringing me a lot of joy and happiness and not have any qualifiers on it. I just want to let the goodness in that you've been giving me. Were you, was it qualified because you were like, there are still other things I want to do to it. There's other work no, I want I to do. I just felt myself like uh, taking it down a notch, like don't get too excited. So I, I just felt myself doing it. Interesting. And I want to be like, yeah, I fucking love it in here. Like th throttling <laughs> down. Oh, another thing that we should just do another hour on the upper limit problem. But <laughs> another thing that I thought of, we have friends and, and clients that we've worked with who people around them, people in their family, shit, uh, my family, I may have absorbed some of the storytelling around me, but that were too much. Yes. And so yes. really emphatic expressions yep. of positive, it can be positivity oh or expressions of feelings. It's a, that Midwestern thing of like, uh -huh. just like, like dial it down. Yes. It down, kid. I was told no one yeah. is that happy. No one is that nice. It can't be real. Yeah. So stop it. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I guess we can't actually, uh, you know, childlike enthusiasm and excitement and joy, but calm it down, like calm yeah. down, basically. Like, I do feel like sometimes here, oh, well, here's one. I just, here's one. I just surfaced a story of my, f that I've made up. Now this isn't mm -hmm. in anything, there is like in every family there, I've, there's a lot of uh, mental health issues that run through my family, very real things, very hospitalizable things that run through my family. And I think that I created, uh, I don't even think of it as an upper limit. I think of it as like, sort of like a full body cast limitation <laughs> that I created around myself. <laughs> And it is if I am too fill in the blank, too effusive, uh -huh. too emotive, <clears throat> too self-expressed, yes, uh, too honest, that it will it is people are going to either think that it's going to lead to insanity and imbalance, or it is actually going to lead to like hospitalizable insanity oh my gosh and i think that uh, i have in order not to scare my family or scare myself i have you know how people say uh, oh i don't know if you've observed this but i have observed myself so many people say to me you have such a calming presence you have such a calming voice <laughs> and i think one of the reasons that i developed that way of being, especially sort of as a teacher and as a leader, is because I want people to, I want to, I want to believe and I want people to believe and know that I am balanced, sane, credible. There is no fear that I'm going to fly off the handle or fly into a mental institution. Wow. So I think that that is a, <laughs> it's, yes. it's really what it's done. And I've really worked on this, and this is part of my yeah. freeing myself and melting the cork, uh -huh. is, is letting myself be sometimes be loud, tell jokes, laugh uh -huh. a lot, cry when I feel uh -huh. like I need to cry, with uh -huh. and trusting and knowing that it doesn't mean that I'm going straight into a mental hospital. That's right. But I've seen, <laughs> right. I've been, I have stood but next to people. <clears throat> 
while and sat in the room while the ambulance came to take them to That's the hospital. Right. So I, I, I've yeah. been right there, and I think there's part of me that that created that story. I can see why I can yeah. see why, because when you are present for that, it becomes a very real thing and a possibility that, you know, a lot of people in life haven't even imagined, you know, like that, that concept is like, oh, well, that doesn't happen. But you are someone as, as many people are who has seen it happen. It has yeah. happened. And so yeah. of course you have internalized a story of like, I don't let that happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, I still think I do. I really keep my, I have this bandwidth that I work within, especially around my family, because I'm like, I don't want to frighten them yeah. because I am a, yeah. an enthusiastic person. So it's yeah. like, we don't want the highs to be too high That's and we right. don't want the lows to be too low <laughs> because we don't want to so scare true. the shit out of them. So um, true. And then I just want to say this, uh, what, do, what do we make of it that I'm going to make this label I'm the what do we make of it is a label. I'm going to put it on my computer. <laughs> what good things are trying to enter my life right now? Yes. And I think that goes yes. to your office and, uh, you know. A hundred percent. I your I'm enjoyment. shocked to realize that was one of my biggest takeaways that I'm like, babe, I'm just going to try to stop myself. Anytime my mind starts to spinning on something, I'm going to say, wait a minute. Disrupt it. What really good things are trying to enter my life right now? I think it's interesting. Yeah. You know what I love about it, Camion? Here's what I love about it. What? I do think in a lot of different ways, even though uh, I haven't read this book yet, you read it recently, but we've been doing a lot of different work on ourselves in the world in a lot of different ways. And I can see how our earlier historic upper level, upper, upper limit, limit, our mm -hmm. upper, upper limit, limit problems from the past, a lot of them have sort of expanded, but as we, and yeah. we've made these lives that we are uh, uh, loving. I mean, sometimes uh -huh. I'm like, mm -hmm. I need a little more rest, but we are loving life and, <laughs> and making, you know, working with clients that we love and, and doing work yes. that we really, really love. And, we there's we have so much we're privileged with so much beauty around us and so much love around us and i think well that is evidence that we have expanded our upper limit and i want to keep doing it and keep yes. doing it and keep doing yes. it and not for the acquisition of more uh wealth or material objects but f so that we can experience life more fully more joy more, more fulfillment and in doing so can help others feel more joy and more fulfillment. Yeah, I love it. And let that I cycle love it. continue. All right. Now Yay. we got to get, we got to get a crack of on this spark. Cause we are, I mean, <laughs> come on. We are way behind here. <laughs> oh my God. TikTok. So, so I so see you ready for a fresh spark. Fresh box. Fresh I'm so box. excited for a fresh spark. I got your fresh spark here. I'm an old timey spark vendor, <laughs> just wheeling my little spark cart through the streets. <laughs> of Excuse me, I'll I'll take three sparks, please. <laughs> How much I'll is take a spark? That little bunch right there. Three for a dollar. I'll take three. Okay. Um, so I'm going to bring in my spark by reading this quote, and I'm going to use the original wording, but I encourage you, Cams, and I encourage listeners to replace the words "write," "writer," and "writing" with "create." creator and creating. Okay. Ready? Uh huh. You are so privileged to be a writer. Normal people, something bad happens to them and there's nothing they can do with it except feel bad or complain or press charges. <laughs> I was very fortunate because I could write about it. I don't know what people do who aren't writers. I went to a doctor in London recently and he told me, you have cancer. And this is before he'd done any tests. And he told me I had cancer. And then he stuck a flexible metal rod up the hole in my penis. And I thought, I can write about this. <laughs> and again, I felt bad for people who aren't writers. I don't have cancer. And he was completely wrong about that. So I got to write about that as well. 
<laughs> as you get older, these things happen more and more often. You fall down and you say, well, I can write about it. So you should celebrate if you get fired from a job or your house catches on fire or you lose a limb that that's not your writing arm. Make the most of it. <laughs> These words were spoken by a human who is my spark for today, David Sedaris. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And I heard him speak these words in his masterclass on masterclass.com. And I was like, hells yes, David Sedaris. And it went straight into my spark file. And now it's going straight into your ear holes. So let's dig into the spark. I love it. And everything you just said, I'm like, hey, the Dalai Lama. And him, like you, like if you yeah. have, yeah, if, if nothing happens to you, you have nothing to write about. Yeah. So yeah. let's, you know, embrace those uh, challenges and their opportunities He's, for creativity. Yeah. We're going to talk more about it because he really, be- he lives this. He uh-huh. really, really lives us. So that mantra that he's repeating, which is, I can write about this, <laughs> even as that flexible metal rod is entering yeah. the hole of your penis. Um, that concept really is near and dear to our hearts, baby cams. Mm-hmm. When we teach creatives or speak to creatives, my shorthand for this has become, if you have to live through it, you might as well get to make something out of yes. it. Yes. And David Sedaris is right. How lucky we makers are. So I expand this. Yes. It's not just writers. Yes. Yeah. We makers we're so lucky to have this option. And I want to say the privilege in this culture and in this day and age, because there was a time when it was, if you were like a lady, it'd be like, (laughs) well, ladies don't do, you know, so we're really lucky. We're living in a time when we can put all of this bull fucking shit into our creativity and we can write about it or dance about it or Ted talk about it or do a tight five minute comedy routine about it or architect about it. It doesn't just have to exist as some terrible shit that happened to us. It can provide raw creative material. It can sharpen our purpose and it can provide us with creative fuel if we metabolize it correctly. Um, And sidebar, as we learned in my spark about burnout, the act of folding these life experiences into creative expression can complete the stress response cycle. So if you haven't listened to that episode, yes, yes, what's wrong with you? I covered the work. That's a classic. Um, (laughs) Classic good looks that never go out of style. I covered (laughs) burnout, the secret to unlocking the stress cycle. And in their work, they say that literary, visual, and performing arts of all kinds give us the chance to celebrate and move through big emotions. They describe it as a cultural loophole in society that there's that thing that tells us to be nice and not make waves, as I was just talking about, but we can take advantage of that loophole as makers. And this is nice because you can either be the creative who is using your work to complete the stress response cycle, or you can simply bear witness to it. You can be in the audience in the dark. You can be the reader. You can be moved by a play or a movie or a dance concert or a symphony or a choir or a piece of writing. And that also completes the stress response cycle, which alleviates burnout, which brings me back to my spark du jour, David Sedaris. If you recall from that burnout spark, laughing, really laughing is another way to complete the stress response cycle. And I can't tell you how many people I have been on. I've been on the subway and I've watched people, all different kinds of people reading a David Sedaris book and shaking with (laughs) laughter. On the subway in New York, which is no mean feat because the subway is not always the jolliest place. But that is the power of Davis Sedaris. He is such a funny writer. He can actually, Uh. actually make you LOL, which is a super rare superpower. So making people laugh this hard, it would be easy to believe that this is something that comes very easily to David Sedaris. He comes Mm -hmm. from a very funny family, which helps for sure. But He also works, and I mean really, really works hard at the craft of writing. So, Mm -hmm. Cam's, I'm going to take you and the listeners through some of the gems he shares in his masterclass, but per usual, this spark is just going to scratch the surface. It's going to be the tip of the sparkberg, if you will. But if you're so moved, (laughs) I encourage you to check out masterclass.com. 
masterclass.com. Not a sponsor, but we wish they were. Um, and if yes, they were a sponsor, please. we would encourage you to use the promo code SPARK10 for 10% off your first purchase. <laughs> JK, that's not real. It's not real, but we wish it was. Someday it will be. Do what I did and just use Laura Camion's username and password to log in. <gasps> but back to David Sedaris. <laughs> we're going to get arrested by the masterclass police. Okay. Sorry, back to class. David Sedaris. I guess I won't hashtag them. <laughs> Thank you, Mending Glass. Or do. Back to David Sedaris. <laughs> back to the gems he shares in this masterclass. Masterclass is great, by the way. If you, It's amazing. I'm telling you. It's so good. It's really, really good. And it gets better with each passing day because they keep adding great I, I watched um i watched rupaul's master class the other day really? rupaul is a spiritual leader i'm telling you uh-huh. I, <laughs> i'm telling you RuPaul's i amazing. believe so, it um so early in david sedaris's master class he talks about writing and humor and he says that he is fortunate to be surrounded by very funny people and one way to infuse humor into your work is to quote funny people, which I thought was actually <laughs> genius. And I think I've been doing it for years because I've just been ripping off Hunter Bell for years. I just like, and I think he's ripped me off too. And it's just like, it's I'm, great. Yes, I'm sure he it's, has. It's, it's really, it, it's a great way to get humor into your work. Mm-hmm. He also advises that you notice when you talk to people if they genuinely laugh at a story that you tell, and if they then go on to ask some follow-up questions, it might be that might be a good indication that it's a good thing to write about. Huh. Further, he encourages us to carry a notebook and to make notes of those times. And I think that's what women mm-hmm. call a spark file, baby. <laughs> he also talks about how you don't you don't have to have lived through extraordinary experiences in order to be a writer. He says, it's not what's happened in your life. It's how you write about it, Mm. which I could not agree with more. He goes on to say, if you're tuned in, life feels like a story. So he talks Mm -hmm. about times when he's been in a restaurant or in a shop or on a vacation with his family. And it's like the subject of the story just crawls up and sits in his lap. (laughs) And he says, pretty much guaranteed, if you're just sitting at home online all day, and then you go for a walk, and you're in your phone texting your friends, and then you're in the line at the grocery store, and you're still texting, nothing is going to come sit in your lap. You need to be in the world. You need to be engaged with the world. And every now and then it will come to you. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be that you're in a car accident or your father is rushed to the hospital with appendicitis. It can be as small as feeding a bird or buying a piece of taxidermy. But again, you have to be open and you have to recognize when it's handed to you. Yes. And I feel like, again, the interconnectedness, the more that we do this podcast, the more I'm like, so many of these concepts are interconnected. Yeah. You have got to be present. You have got to be engaged in your life. And sometimes that means setting your phone down, or we'll talk about it later, like writing, writing, sitting at your desk writing yeah. without access to the internet. Yes. Things like that. You have to be present. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as an interviewer, there was a segment that I found particularly interesting about asking better questions. And he says, instead of, this is just from a perspective of a writer, from Uh the perspective of a writer, he says, instead of asking strangers and Uber drivers and people at your book signing, how's your day going? Or how was your trip in? Or got any big plans for the weekend? (laughs) Spice it up because if you ask better questions, you may spark conversations that can become fodder for stories that you can put in your spark file. So questions he has asked include things like, do you know a lot of doctors (laughs) or do you know many people in wheelchairs or when's the last time you touched a monkey? He says in his masterclass, he said to a woman, he's never asked that question before. So when was the last time you touched a monkey? And she goes, oh my God, can you smell it on me? (laughs) And it turned out... (laughs) And it turned out this woman worked at a facility that trained monkeys to be like service animals for people, for quadriplegics. And she invited him to 
to this facility? <laughs> and he said, yes. And we're going to get to that in a second. Like oh. say yes to weird adventure. Yes. Say yes to adventure. Yes. Say yes to life. Yes. Um, other questions. Have you ever run for office? Do you have any friends named Daniel? You can see <laughs> how these questions, they, they could, they could just go, no, 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 I don't have any friends named Daniel. Or they could go, you know, I don't currently, but I had an ex-husband named Daniel. Uh -huh. Like you can see how these questions might lead to some interesting interactions, which would be great for somebody who wants to write funny stuff. Yes. And I'll tell you, as somebody who's been interviewing people for decades, <sighs> That provided me with some fresh inspiration. Oh, I bet. Oh, my God. Oh, gosh. my God. So fun. That's so, just a delight. Can you smell it on me? Can you smell it on me? Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you in a minute, I'll tell you another way he uses that, which is so fun. So David talks about a moment where a friend of his was explaining that his phone was a shield against small talk. And David argued that it doesn't have to be small talk. You can influence oh. what it's going to be. And he concluded by saying, as long as I'm having encounters with people, I want them to be meaningful to the extent that they can be. Yes. I, I yes. talk about this, you know, when I talk about nobody's above me, nobody's below me, haters to the left, that little concept uh -huh. that I, uh -huh. that I enjoy living by when I, um, am, I always think of it like when I'm visiting, uh, when I'm being hosted by someplace where I'm teaching a masterclass or a workshop and I'm in the company cafeteria or I'm in the university cafeteria or whatever it is, I love, I love talking to cafeteria staff and I love saying, um, how long have you worked here? And tell me what you think is good. Tell me what food is served in this cafeteria oh, that you, you love to yes. eat. And it, it not only, um, not only do I learn what food to select and eat at that host institution, <laughs> but I also have learned so much about people's lives and how long they've had that job and if they love the job or hate the job. And, you know, sometimes mm. these, these conversations, they only last two minutes, three minutes. And they're some of my favorite memories because I feel like yeah. I had a meaningful connection to the extent that I could in, in a, well, what could be a very mundane or very, uh, just a forgettable afternoon. But you also could be uh, working through the stress cycle because the, you know, um, that's right, baby. Positive social interaction is like a yeah. way. So if you're there and you've got, you know, teaching on your mind and, and, you know, having a positive interaction with someone like that, that just takes a couple minutes um, and reminds and you us just that walk the world away is like, good yeah. and safe. Yeah. yeah the world that's is exactly. good and safe and yes. there are good people in it. That's right. You're absolutely right. David also talks about when you say no, everything stops. So uh -huh. he says yes a lot. And I have also uh -huh. felt that as a, as a, as a creative, uh -huh. it embol yeah. being a, being a maker emboldens me to engage with people and adventures that I normally would not have engaged with. And yeah, because I'm sort of like, well, Maybe I'll be able to make something out of it. So it's it's an, it, uh -huh. it really has gotten me up and out of my own self, you know. Um, yeah, David. Yeah. David encourages us to take a chance and do things you wouldn't normally do, not to endanger yourself, but but it's as long as you're going to be safe. Like if you can live it, you can write about it. And I couldn't agree more yeah. with that. I love it so much. Uh, I love that. I love that concept. There's this whole, there's, there's this whole part of this where <laughs> he talks about this for a variety of reasons, but he talks about how your character is based on how you treat the people you could mistreat, which I think is mm -hmm. a great idea. So how do you behave towards people like, whether it's a cafeteria worker or a, a waiter or a bus boy or somebody in service who you could mistreat? Right. And as long as the, is, the customer is always right philosophy, which yeah. guides so our culture, not all cultures, yeah. but our culture. It's a good yeah. measure of yeah. character. But he says he lives for it when he is mistreated because it's like people are handing him money because he knows he can make a story <laughs> out of it. So 
I, it's interesting because it also goes back to when, like, oh, well, at least I can write about it. Mm-hmm. Like when shitty things are happening, he's sort of like, he welcomes it on some level because he knows he's going to be able to put it in his work. Oh. And speaking of work, David talks a lot about how he works and how much he works. And he describes the way he structures his writing practice Mm -hmm. this way. He gets up, he goes straight to his desk, he writes in his diary, then he turns to whatever essay he's working on. He writes from about 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 1. So that's about three and a half hours. Then he goes and he picks up garbage off the roads until about eight o'clock at night. Then He sits down at his desk for another hour and then he works some more. Then he has dinner and sometimes he goes back to work after dinner, but usually not. And he knows that for himself, it's very important to write every single day. This isn't in my spark, but I just saw your face go boing, 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 when I said he goes out and he picks up trash from about 1.30 until 8 o'clock at night. But six hours, Um, six and a half hours? Yeah. David Sedaris has picked, he's picked up so much trash in this little like village area where he lives with his, with his boyfriend, Hugh in the UK that they named a trash truck after him. Like Uh, he's done so uh, much cleaning. uh, And you remember before he became a writer, he famously, he was a house cleaner. He cleaned people's apartments in Chicago. So he's somebody. And before that, he's somebody who he loved to clean his room when he was little. Like, I think it helps him with his, OCD and stuff like that Uh to clean. Yeah. But, and this isn't in my spark. He talks about how there are a lot of people in his area who don't know that he is David Sedaris. They don't know that he sold 14 million books and counting around the world. And so they treat him like he might have a a learning disability or that (sighs) he's a poor man who what he does, maybe his little job is that he picks up trash and they show their Uh. character with the way they treat him. And they say, you know, when you're done with that, why don't you, um, why don't you come clean up my street or oh. bless your soul? I hope nobody takes advantage of you. And he's like, keep it coming. Cause it's oh. all going into my writing, which I think is really funny. So um, <laughs> when young writers say to him that they write when it strikes them, he says, I don't know. Oh. I suppose it might work for some people, but it never would have worked for him. He says, so much happens Mm. by sitting at your desk. When you don't have an idea, so many things can happen, but they're not going to happen unless you're at your desk. So you need to sit there and not have the internet and see what happens. You just have to do the work. And that means not going to the party. And it means people are really going to think you're a drag. He says he can't begin to say how many people have lectured him over the years saying, you can't, you can't come out for dinner just this once. You're being so selfish by not doing this. Everybody else is going to be there. Hmm. And he he goes on to say, he's met so many people who say, you know, I want to write, but I work all day. And his response is, so did I. You work all day and then Uh you come home and you write. If it means that much to you, you're going to find the time to do it. It's never an excuse to say that you don't have the time. There are a lot of people out there who are happy to give 10%, but I don't know their names because they don't have books. And I was like, shit, David Sedaris. Snap. I'll snap. Whoa. Um, uh, There's a... One of the reasons Masterclass is so great is because I think the classes are really thoughtful, but there's a PDF that you can download with with each class that can sort Uh of become sort of a study Uh guide and a workbook. So from the PDF that accompanies his Masterclass, it says, David goes on reading tours twice a year and hits about 45 cities on each tour. He usually prepares four or five essays along with diary entries to read aloud. And at the end, he'll do a Q&A session. Reading aloud is another layer of David's editing process, kind of like live workshopping. Mm. In fact, he'll make notes yes. on his pages when he reads. So literally the audience is responding. And if you've ever seen a video of David Sedaris at a reading, and there's beautiful, they're, they're beautifully included in this masterclass. When the audience is laughing, he's making notes. When the audience coughs, it's like they're throwing skulls at you. They're telling you that if this was on the page, <laughs> they would be skimming now. At the end of the night, yes. I'll lay my 
listen, this, listen to this fucking work ethic. At the end of the night, I'll lay my story out on the hotel bed and look at my notes and I'll notice the flow of the laughter. I want there to be a rhythm to it. I want it to be like a roller coaster that the audience is strapped into. So in addition to finding the essay's slow spots, David also uses this method, method to catch unintentional repetition of words or other sections that don't seem to land with a broader subset of readers. Now, I think this is so brilliant because this is how he's honing the material that will go into yep. his next book. It's not a look back at like, yep. here's my published work. This yep. is him Pone, polishing, polishing, polishing Genius. what readers around the world are then going to get to read, which I think is brilliant. But I do think there's ways that, and they suggest this in this PDF, that there are ways that even if you don't have an audience of a thousand people to send you messages about what you should cut and what you should tighten up and what you know duplicative words you should take out, you can do this with friends. You could do this on Zoom with a like a small group of friends. So yeah, I think it's great. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, Camion. There's a great thing where in this masterclass, David does this thing where he takes a single story and he shares several drafts of the opening scene from an essay from the original diary entry and then all the way through to the final essay that was published in The New Yorker. And it is amazing to hear how he... He and it's they're not small changes. They are yeah. not small changes. Yeah. He, how he workshops it and workshops it and workshops it. I gotta um, say, I just want I just want everyone to hear that because just how often are we, you know, working with people who you know, you've put your heart into your first draft and it's it's super important and it, it's meaningful, but it's your first draft. And even David yes. Severus is like there's going to be 25 drafts. There's going to be 47 well, drafts, you know. To your point, yes. He talks about giving notes on other people's writing. And he says, nine times out of 10, my only comment is you need to rewrite this 60 times. Mm. Most people don't want to hear that you have to rewrite this one time. But that's mm -hmm. what writing is. It's rewriting. It's Sometimes rewriting. you think... I'm just so bored with this. It's not worth diving back into. And that's fine because not everything is worth diving back into. But I would say personally, I probably rewrite something over 12 to 18 times before I give it to my editor. Because if I were to give it to my editor, because if I were to give my editor a uh -huh. first draft, knowing that I was going to write 20 drafts before I was even sure of the essay, she's going to be sick of it by the third draft. And so by the 20th draft, she's going to be uh -huh. sick about it. So I personally, these are David's words. So I personally like to learn as much as I can on my own and then turn to my editor uh -huh. and then say, can you help me here? This is as far as I have been able to take it myself. And I thought that was genius. Uh, and it's so, if you've, if you've ever made yes. anything that you're really, really uh, proud of, you'll recognize that process. You will recognize that process. It's, it's fascinating uh -huh. to me because I do think this is what separates those who like the idea of making versus those who are able to really hang tough in the actual process of revising and revising and revising first with yourself and then with um, an outside editor or listener or reader yeah. or responder. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of the equivalent, I think, to, um, I'm just now thinking of this right now. It's not fully formed, but when, you know, actors, they say have to get accustomed to rejection and not being right for the role or getting feedback and, you know, it, it isn't your time or whatnot. Um, this isn't, this isn't going to be your project. Yeah. Writers, it, it, this, this, process of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting is a little bit of that. It's a little bit of like um, the thick skin that is required <laughs> of like, okay, there's going to be notes on it 47 times. And then it's going to, you know, emerge as something that you're super, super proud of. But yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I just, it just occurred to me like there is, there are some similarities there in, in terms of like writers don't get um, 
you don't get to sidestep <laughs> that type yeah, of the development. Um, yeah, the development. Yeah. It's hard though. I mean, I know we have, I'm thinking of you, Laura Coward. Hi. Hi we just said Coward. your name on a podcast and how you can hit those patches where you're like, I am so fatigued by this. Yeah. I want to set it aside for a time being. And I think that's a very healthy thing to do for as sure. well. Let your brain work on it for a while because it will Let be. That, yeah. Let the big swirly work on it for uh -huh. a while. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, yeah. So turning to another thing that really spoke to me as a podcaster, as a lover of podcasts and podcast musicals and podcast theater, he talked about something that he learned from working on the radio. And that is you don't want to overwhelm the listener with too many characters or put too many people on the stage of the listener's mind. Ooh. I think that's super helpful to keep in mind. And honestly, Cami, and I even think about it when we have a female guest on the podcast uh, or, yeah. or even more so when we have two and I'm like, we need to be conscious that the listener may not be able to tell all of these, all these voices, voices apart. apart. Yeah. 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 It's true. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. It creates another barrier um, between you and, and your audience, because only some people are going to take that ride and want to work that hard to sort out all these characters. Yeah. And other people yeah. are going to be like, uh, I can't. And, you know, put it down or set it aside. Yeah. But so, can we help yeah. the listener? That's right. Can we just be, and I remember when we first started this podcast and I would be like, this is Susan. This is what my voice sounds like. <laughs> and we would keep, and you'd be like, I'm Laura. This is what my voice sounds like. And we kept signposting it until we forgot and we stopped doing it. Uh, but I think it's worth thinking about. I think about uh, artists that we're working with who are doing things like making podcast musicals. Hi, Jennifer. And how mm -hmm. you you want to just make sure that you're really helping your listener sort it out in a really, really good, clear way. That's right. That's right. Agreed. Another piece of this that I loved, he talks, oh, I love this so much. He talks about the experience of attending readings of other authors and their book signings and how this before, you know, he was a household name, how nervous he would be mm -hmm. for that moment when he would approach the author. And he said the kindest authors were the ones who would see you as a person and they would take that nervousness away. But he recalled one author who sort of took his book and never looked at him and said something to her publicist who was standing next to her and then signed the book and sort of pushed it back across the table towards him and never, ever in really truly engaged or even looked at David. And in that, in that moment, David said to himself, when it's my turn, I'm going to see people and I'm going to keep them in front of me until they get thirsty. And he does. He oh. has a conversation with everyone who comes through those signing lines and he asks them one of those awesome bananas questions that he <laughs> formulates. Do you have any friends named Greg? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And Amazing. He, he messes with people. He said he's gotten really good at guessing people's age and he'll do it. He'll, he'll do it like this. He'll be like, how has 51 been for you? And people will be like, <gasps> oh my God, who, who have you been talking? Or, or, or he'll sometimes he'll do things like he'll go Sagittarius. And he's <laughs> like, I don't know if they're a Sagittarius, <laughs> but if they are, he it's like it's like a magic trick. It's really he's amazing. Really funny. Amazing. He stresses how important it is to be good, kind, and nice to people, mm. to be a person who people want to help and support, to be generous, mm. to be interested in other people's writing, mm. to read other people's books and be specific in your positive feedback to them. And to celebrate <sighs> other people and their accomplishments, which reminded me so much of our conversation with um, Sir Richard Eyre when he was saying how he takes delight in other people's success. And I That's thought, right. what a beautiful quality to develop in yourself. 
It really is. I have to say, Suze, one person in my life stands above all others in this regard, and that is Wes. Wes Day, he celebrates every single person without hesitation when they something great has happened to them, regardless of how, you know, his history with that person or how well he knows them or doesn't know them. It doesn't matter. He's like, that is amazing. Like he's so excited. He's thrilled for them. And, and I feel like I have benefited from, from that practice of just that's great. Uh, the immediate reaction is joy and happiness for that person. I love that. We really, I do want to come up with a word for that. I'm yeah. That. I think there's a word for it. There is. <laughs> that made me laugh so hard when Richard Ayer said, why, why you don't you just need a call word? it taking delight in other people's success? And I was like, Where's so the fun words. in that, Richard? You love to make <laughs> up like words. Seven words. It's <laughs> <laughs> so many words. I'm so tired, Richard. Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to conclude this spark by reading David's words directly <gasps> from the conclusion of his masterclass because it really is okay. just gems upon gems. And again, this is the tip of the Sparkberg. So please check it out. That's right. The most important thing to develop discipline for writing is to set a time and sit down and stay at your desk for a certain amount of time and increase and increase and increase the time. I can't tell you how many times I've been at my desk and I've had nothing and I've looked out my window and I've seen something and maybe it's just watching birds fighting Mm -hmm. and that can lead to something. But unless you're sitting at your desk, it's not going to happen. So you really need to develop that habit of sitting at that desk And as long as you're there, and as long as you write every day, and as long as you read everything you can get your hands on, you're going to get better. Don't confuse writing with publishing. They're two completely different things. Let the world Mm. take care of the publishing part. That's not your job. I wrote every day for 15 years before my first book came out. That seemed normal to me. I throw away maybe one third of what I write. That's normal to me. Sometimes it's easy but most times it's not. That's normal to me. Every day is not going to be a great day at your desk. That's normal. Nobody has a great day at their desk every day. You really need to get to work now. I don't mean to suggest that you weren't working before you started watching this, but if I could do anything, I would just want you to know how possible it is. I remember the day that I announced to myself that I want to be a writer. I've been writing for five years by that point, and I remember I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was riding my bike, and I remember exactly where I was on the road, and I said to myself, I want to be a writer. And it's terrifying to say that because once you announce an ambition, if it doesn't work out, then you're a failure. Even if you just tell no one but yourself, you're setting yourself up. It's scary to say you want to do something, but there comes a point, if you're serious about it, you have to say, at least to yourself, this is what I want. And there are stakes involved because if you don't get it, you think, how do I deal with that? But you know what? If I can write 10 books, and if I can be in The New Yorker, and if I can have my own radio show on the BBC, anyone can. I am not naturally a talented writer. I'm not. There are people funnier than me. There are people who are better storytellers than me. And I made it. And there's not a single day that I don't marvel at that. And I think, why me and not somebody else? But there's nothing terribly special about me. I don't look special. I can't believe I'm on the radio with this voice. I met a teacher and he said and he had his students listen to a bit of my audiobook and he said, what did you think? And one of the kids said, I just feel sorry for that old lady. And the teacher (laughs) said, what old lady? And the kid said, the one they hired to read that stupid book. (laughs) Not just a woman, but an old woman. That's who he thought I was. But how can you be on the radio with this voice? I divide the world into two groups of people. Those who pay someone to listen to their problems and those who get paid for telling people their problems. Oh! I'm very fortunate to be in group number two. Oof! And there's a spot here waiting for you when you're ready. When you're ready. Oh! I've saved a spot right next to me for you. And I can't wait to hear about everything that has gone wrong in your life. <laughs> 
on a stall. Oh my God, I'm in tears. He's oh. really, he's so but if you talk about completing the stress response cycle, he's so funny. He's so, there, there's something, this, like I just said, it's the tip of the Sparkberg. He has so much wisdom to share and it's packed into this masterclass. But he's somebody who has, and I cannot stress this enough, done the fucking work. Yes. It's amazing. It's it's just, it, it, I see it over and over and over again. And we've talked about it before. I talked about it on that Spark that I did about... Martin Short and preparation and yeah. people who really, they make it look so easy. David Ugh. Sedaris seems like a fucking natural. He didn't have his first book published until he had been writing for 15 years. Every day for 15 Every day. years. Uh, Every day. It's amazing. And even yeah. just the way that ending that you just read where he's like, I've saved a spot here for you. So generous. It's so generous and so kind and so warm. And then says, I can't wait to hear all the things that have gone wrong in your life. Like <laughs> the way he can twist it, you know, it's oh my God. so delightful. I was like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm about to cry, but now I'm laughing. And now these are tears <laughs> of laughter. It's, yeah. it's truly such a gift, but yeah. it's fascinating to hear him say, I'm not even the best writer. I'm not that good. I work really, really, really hard at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because just far too many people don't believe that. And I still think that's hard to believe because he obviously has some natural gifts, but we don't know um, how, how many of those things was he just born with and they just spark, you know, right off his tongue. And it's just like the, his natural state of being and how many of them have been crafted and developed thoughtfully over years. I'm sorry, that thing. I just feel sorry for that old lady. That old, lady. old lady. The one they hired to read that stupid that book. stupid book is so amazing. <laughs> oh my God, he's so good. So what do we make of it, Laura Camion? What do we make of it? If you truly want to make, then make a structured creative discipline for yourself. Make Increase your time. stamina. Revise, revise, revise. Take things as far as you can before you bring it to that first reader or editor or responder. If you haven't already done so, I highly recommend you you make a good time for yourself by reading David's writing or better yet, listen to it. I fucking love the story you can't kill the rooster and they're on YouTube. Do you know that story? I about I his need brother Paul. Um, I need it's about more. his brother Paul and his brother Paul. They're from all from North Carolina, but Paul uh -huh. still has like the thick North Carolina uh -huh. accent, and he's uh -huh. like cusses cusses more than I do, and he's just like, "You can't kill the motherfucking rooster, motherfucker." Do you know that story? I don't think I know this one. You're in for a treat. Or, uh, <laughs> there's there's a really really good live recording on YouTube that I okay. recommend. Um, uh, listen to the story Me Talk Pretty one day uh. recorded in front of a live audience. It's He's so good. Um, and another, you know, maybe this is simple or hard depending on who you are, but another what do we make of it is putting your fucking phone down and engaging with strangers, whether it's in the grocery store <laughs> or just engaging with the world in ways that go past. Um, how's your day? Yeah. Like, which I'll take, like, I'll take how's your day even more than just head in a phone. But, uh, but <laughs> can you imagine if you said to a grocery store clerk, do you know anyone <laughs> named Daniel? They'd be like, why? Do you have any friends named Daniel? Why? Why do you ask? <laughs> I just feel like you could but, really be met but, with people like, what? But you could say something like, so what's the weirdest thing you've scanned today? Exactly. And that would be, that's the kind of question that would might even just make somebody laugh yeah, or smile. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There were other sparks and so many other sparks, but he, they do such a good job with these classes. They are chock-a-block with sparks. And I'm actually going to hold some of those back and I'm going to save oh, them. They sparked off future. into other sparks. They've sparked into other sparks. I love it. I think what I'm going to make of it is I'm going to make the time, make that time, set that time to show up at my desk because I do do a lot, but it is often um, unstructured time. Mm -hmm. Like I find, yeah. I found this 15 minutes. I found that hour, but uh -huh. um really getting back into a practice of a certain time of day. This is what transpires. Yeah. I love it. 
I love it. I love this. Yes. Uh, what a fun episode. Good job. Good love job, that. everybody. Good job, I everyone. think that's it. I think Good so. job, listeners. <laughs> Everybody did good today. We loved your focus. We loved your attention. <laughs> we even loved you when your attention wandered. Even then. Even then. We always love you. This episode of The Spark File was made on Muncie, Lenape, and Seminole land. And as always, we hope that this put another bunch of sparks in your file. Listen to me. If there's a spark you'd like us to explore, or if you've taken a spark and fanned it into a creative flame, and you'd like to share the light of that with the world, email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. And you know what? We will even take your feedback. We really, truly will. But you know the price of admission. First, you have to share a creative risk that you've taken recently. You can follow us on social media at The Spark File and be sure to subscribe, rate, five-star review this podcast. It really really, really helps other listeners find Mm -hmm. us. And if you like this podcast, we do hope you'll share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, go pee on someone else's lamppost. (laughs) If something (laughs) tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, we're writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that's been knocking at your door. It is your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame. You gotta take it and and make, make it. it. Bye. Bye. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my spark files. Could be something that I wanna make or how I wanna be. I pump it in my spark files. I jump into my spark fire. Let's open up the spark fire. Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from the Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for the Spark File Illume, a nine month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in a loom, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level, and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illume might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illume, but do it now to find out if Illume is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illume. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illume and join us for a loom.